Hi everyone, we're going to finish up our lecture on culture here, tying up some of the loose ends and continuing along to learn about why culture is so important to everyone as a foundation or a lens by which they view the world. Cultural change can be hard for everyone. We don't like our world to be disrupted. And so there are a couple of concepts here, culture shock and culture lag, that we can discuss, which explain different ways that cultures can change. Culture shock is where you have an emotional response to the changes in a culture. We oftentimes experience this when we go somewhere new, uh, maybe another country or even another state or another region of our state where the customs and the behaviors are very different than what we're used to at home. We get kind of a feeling of being a fish out of water. We don't really understand why things are being done the way they are, and we may question whether or not the way things are being done is, quote unquote, the right way to do things. This can cause us to feel stress. It can cause us to lash out. It's really important, I think, for us to understand that our culture at home is not the same as the culture elsewhere, and it's not the other culture's job to change itself for our pleasure. It's our job to try and work with the culture in which we are so that we can have a positive experience. Culture lag is a concept that explains the gap between what we're willing to adopt and how technology rapidly develops. Um, I can best explain this when I speak to my mother oftentimes. She has questions about how to use certain features of her phone. Uh, I installed a streaming service on one of her televisions and I always have to field questions about how that works and why it works the way it does and what she needs to do to make changes to make it uh, easier for her. I recall when I first started teaching courses online and I actually had an elderly student in a class that came to my office and I had to teach them how to use what we consider to be basic technologies to get through the course successfully. So there's an interesting theory by the anthropologist Margaret Mead, and she theorized that this technology gap that we have between generations is what drives that generation gap, that difference in approach to how we use technology in our lives is what causes the gap between generations to feel so broad. When I talk to my students about technology, they're so comfortable with all aspects of technology and it's hard for me to convince younger people that another 10 to 20 years from now, when they are firmly in their middle years, they are also going to start to feel this culture lag with regard to technology. We feel uh, tapped out as far as wanting to learn more technology, and we feel like what we know is enough to get us by, and so we don't feel that desire or need to have to learn more. But younger people are always going to be coming up with technology that is native to them. They were born with it and it becomes second nature and they don't have to learn these things that older generations would have to spend a lot of time and mental effort to learn. We also need to consider a concept called the cultural ideal. Now remember, we've learned that ideals don't exist in the real world. But when we're talking about culture, thinking about what the cultural ideal is or could be is a very powerful research tool. The ideal, if we can describe it, gives us a way to measure reality. And so if we were to do a research project on ideal American culture 
or ideal patriotic culture, or ideal bodybuilding culture, any one of these things, millions of things. If we could set down a list of what that ideal would look like, it allows us to be able to measure how far away from the ideal that reality actually is. And this allows us to be able to describe things uh, with its functions and dysfunctions much more clearly than if we didn't have that measuring stick that we could use. So cultural ideals or ideal types in general are really good research tools for us as we attempt to describe all kinds of cultural aspects and components of the world. And of course, communication is a very important way to transmit culture. We oftentimes don't really stop to consider the impacts that language, verbal and nonverbal, can have on how we view the world, how we view culture. So a question that we need to ask is how do we communicate? How do we communicate culture? Sometimes we communicate it verbally, but other times it's by gesturing. We've already learned about that in one of the other parts of this lecture. We sometimes express our culture with use of values, oftentimes expressed as value pairs. When value pairs tend to support each other, we call them value clusters. When they tend to work against each other, we call them value conflicts. And an example of that, we can use the notion of hard work equaling success. In our culture, we are told that if we work really hard, we'll be successful. But in a capitalist society, hard work does not always equal success. We have significant numbers of people in our society that work very, very hard every day, day in and day out, year in and year out, and yet never reap any kind of financial successes from those efforts. So this is an example where two of our very important cultural values, hard work and success, could be expressed as clusters, but may also be expressed as value conflicts. So now remember, we've already talked about language being a symbol for our thoughts. It is also an essential transmitter of culture. It represents who we are and how we see the world around us. And it tells other people who we are as individuals, as groups inside our society, and as a nation. And so for every group, every nation, every region around the world, language symbolically transmits our culture. So that brings us to an interesting hypothesis called the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. So this is the work of two linguists in the earlier part of the 20th century by the names of Edward Sapir and Benjamin Whorf. And they hypothesized that language frames how we view the world. It's a foundation for how we express our culture. So the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis says that language and culture are connected together, that the way we view the world around us is because of the way we have created our language and the way we use words to express uh, the social reality that we see. And it is just a hypothesis or a theory, if you will, because we can't prove that language is the way we view the world. Language equals culture. As an example, by about the 1950s or 60s, uh, behavioral or cognitive psychology became much more popular as a way to describe how people see the world around them. But I do think that the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis is interesting to consider. As an example, in the United States, we have a very individualistic society, meaning that we get messages told to us all the time about how we have to make our lives work, that the individual is the most important component in being successful, 
and you have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. So we are a very individualistically oriented type of society. In other societies around the world, however, the focus tends to be more communal. Uh, as an example, smaller, more indigenous groups perhaps tend to think of things in terms of the we rather than the me. And so there's a focus on the group working together to make all people successful within the group versus where we're told that it's just really on us to make ourselves successful. And if we don't, then something's wrong with us. So I do think that the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis has value with regard to us considering how our language teaches us about how we are and how our country is. The bottom line about the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis is this. It is, philosophically speaking, what we would call a tautology. We can't say definitively that language shapes society. We also can't say definitively that society shapes language. And so it's kind of a circular argument, a chicken and egg discussion that we have when we talk about and think about the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. We also need to think about high culture and pop culture and why these two aspects of culture are so different. High culture is oftentimes paired with the concept of low culture, and these are rather stereotypical terms essentially. High culture is um, described as the pattern of experiences and attitudes that exist in the highest or el most elite segments or classes of a society. So in the United States, uh, one of the main attributes of high culture would be wealth, excessive money, um, and a lifestyle that you can have that that money brings. So it's expensive, it's very formal and exclusive. The types of things you enjoy as a member of the high culture are radically different than things that you might uh, enjoy as part of the low culture or popular culture group. As members of the high culture, you would enjoy going to the symphony or having had uh, your degree conferred to you by Harvard or traveling around the world in a private plane, those kinds of things. So we're talking about a very, very small percentage of the population of our country. But nonetheless, this group separates itself from the rest of society by the way it speaks and the way it behaves. Uh, the painting that you see here in front of you is a painting by Jackson Pollock. And we may look at it and think to ourselves, what the heck is that? That just looks like a bunch of paint splattered on a bunch of boards, and essentially it is. Jackson Pollock was famous for this kind of painting, but what's interesting about his work is that it regularly sells at auctions in the tens of millions of dollars. We might look at this kind of painting and think to ourselves, I can do that. I don't understand why people are paying tens of millions of dollars for that kind of stuff. And as a member of the high culture, we might say, well, clearly you don't understand the artistic value because you're not one of us. You don't understand the contributions that Pollock's work has made to the field of art. You could never fully appreciate how important his work is because you're not one of us. And so the way that the high culture frames this conversation about art in general is to use it as a gatekeeping tool to tell the rest of the world, the rest of us, the lowly people, why we can never be one of them. Instead, we might enjoy something like this, a piece of graffiti, that uh, was probably sprayed on the side of a building and has since been sandblasted or washed away. But we see it and we see some value in it. We enjoy it as we pass it by and it becomes a public piece of art. This is part of the pop culture, a pattern of experiences that exist in the mainstream. 
We, instead of going to the ballet, are going to go to a baseball game. We, instead of going to a symphony, are going to go to a heavy metal concert. And so there is a difference in the perspective, a difference in how we view the world and a difference in what we enjoy about the world. So some people would say that these two distinct types of culture can never meet and that the high culture will work hard to keep the rest of us, the low culture or the pop culture or the mainstream culture out of their group. I mean, that's really just food for thought, right? But if you look at Pollock's work with this piece of graffiti side by side, while I immensely enjoy the work of Jackson Pollock, I'm certainly not a member of the high class or the elite class. And I can see the value in the graffiti. So to me, I'm never going to be a member of the high culture. And I recognize how the high culture oftentimes describes things in a gatekeeping kind of way to keep the rest of the riffraff out. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this final lecture about culture. This is an essential, a key area of study for sociologists. It is invisible to the naked eye, but it influences every aspect of our lives. It affects how we see ourselves. It affects how we see others and it becomes a foundation that guides all of our thoughts and actions in our lifetime. It's important also to remember for those of us who will do research with human subjects that we have to work really hard to keep those cultural biases in check. All right, take care. Bye-bye.